Hello, I'm Dr. Keo Trao, and I want to tell you why playing video games is not a waste of time or a banal pastime, but you can actually learn a lot from it. Today I will be talking about a fun and funny puzzle video game, The World of Goo, which is available for many consoles and you can use in many environments. But before we continue, I would like to ask you a small favor. If you like my videos, please consider subscribing or sharing with your friends. It's really just a click for you and it really means a lot to me. So yeah, let's start. World of Goo is a single player indoor puzzle video game, developed and published by 2D Boy and released in 2008. The game is available for a number of consoles including Android, iOS, Nintendo Switch, and Linux and Windows PC. For this review, I will be playing the PC version of the game, available in Steam. I will start reviewing the story of the game and doing a brief analysis of the narrative. Although I always try to keep this as general as possible without telling anything from the ending of the game, this part might contain spoilers. So if you really want to avoid spoilers, just please jump to this part in the video. And let's go! World of Goo doesn't really follow a story as such. It is more of a series of puzzles divided into five chapters. Each chapter featuring their own aesthetics and challenges, and wrapped by a motif which serves as narrative. The story is mostly told by means of cutscenes, which happen after certain critical spots in the game as well as signs that are written by an unknown person who signs as the sign painter, and some others that are written by Mom. Everything starts when the World of Goo Corporation extends several pipes across the world, waking up the Goo Balls, which are extremely curious. Driven by their curiosity, they approach the pipes where they are sucked and transported to the World of Goo Corporation, where they are processed and transformed into products. With the high demand of Goo products, the World of Goo Corporation starts requiring more energy, so they start looking at a different part of the world where a long forgotten energy source lies. They discover the source of energy was beauty, and it had the shape of a woman. However, due to age, the beauty decreased and so did the energy. The corporation then finds a new type of Goo, the beauty Goo and injects it in the forehead of the energy source, to which she starts producing energy again. With the new discovered energy source, the corporation starts developing a new product that will revolutionize the world. By the end of the chapter, the World of Goo Corporation launches Product Set, which introduces a new dimension to the world, the Set Coordinate or Third Dimension. However, the world is not compatible with Product Set and everything in it disappears and is replaced by a new dimension. With everything rendered three-dimensional, the Goo Balls start looking for a way to recover the world, first by restoring the graphic engine to its original form, and then by finding Mom, which turns out to be a huge spam machine. She gives the Goo Balls a way to undelete all spam mail on the history of the web, so the Goo Balls proceed to send a massive spam tsunami to the World of Goo Corporation, making it explode in the process. In the last chapter, the remaining Goo Balls learn that they are the only ones, as the Goo has gone extinct thanks to the World of Goo Corporation harvesting them. So they start an adventure trying to see what lies beyond and if there are new horizons for them to explore. For this, they need to reach a telescope and to deal with the thick cloud of dust created after the explosion of the corporation. Finally, the game also showcases a sandbox mode in front of the corporation. Here is where all the exceeding goo is stored and players can create a tower of goo and try to reach new heights with their tower while competing with other players whose tower's height is represented by a cloud. The game doesn't really have a narrative as we are used to in games. That is, no overcoming the monster or hero quest or rebirth. There are just some stories somehow tied up together in something we can construct as an arc of the rise and fall of the World of Goo Corporation. However, the main characters here are basically two. 
First, there are the goo balls, which are different in every story and which are trying to overcome a challenge to satisfy their curiosity to get into the pipe. Then there is you, the player, the one the sign painter is talking to. But what are you? What is your journey? Maybe the narrative of the game changes depending on the person playing the game. Who knows? Puzzle games are great for fostering cognitive skills, and World of Goo is not the exception. Indeed, the game features such a complexity that today I want to introduce two terms that are not psychological skills as such, but are more related to psychological theory. And those are the concepts of assimilation and accommodation. But uh, let's start from the beginning. The first skill I see tapped by the game is physico-mechanical reasoning. We already know that physico-mechanical reasoning is our ability to solve problems using our understanding and models of the physical and mechanical properties of the world. We also know that physico-mechanical reasoning in games is not really related to our reasoning of real-world physics, but it is about creating a mental model of how the physics of the game work and apply them to the problems that emerge there. In War of Goo, we see these mechanics in the form of gravity, structure bounciness, wind, and resistance of the structures before they break. Let's check them. As the main goal of the puzzles is to reach a pipe far away, you are normally required to build up or over a chasm, in which case the main difficulty is to beat the gravity. As you can guess, you cannot build structures that are particularly stable with goo, so sooner or later the structures you build start balancing from one side to the other and eventually get skewed and break. So you need to plan ahead and check if you need to support your structure in extra points, or to use another type of coup in a certain point to balance your structure and reach your goal. Some levels have wind, which influences the way your goo behaves, pushing it to different directions. So you need to calculate trajectories for your goo so it doesn't fall out of balance before you want it to, or so it doesn't go where you don't want it to go. The bounciness is another thing you need to account for as goo structures are bouncy and unstable, but if they start oscillating too much, your structure will break. Finally, you have the resistance of the goo structures. As you can imagine, with all that bounciness, sometimes the structures break or fall into themselves. So planning for that is also part of the challenge. And that takes me to planning. Planning is part of our executive functions. It is our ability to go from an initial state to a desired state or goal. When planning, you subdivide your main goal into smaller reachable goals, so that a smaller goal, or the sum of smaller goals, act as a step to the next, until you reach the last and biggest goal. You use planning when you are organizing your day, going to work, or arranging a trip. It is really one of the cognitive skills you use the most. In War of Goo, you use planning when you construct a route and as a way to organize your Goo structures so that they can reach the pipe, which is their final destination. This includes planning for how the structures will balance best, where to put balancing spots, and which types of Goo to use at particular points or times. Take here for instance, you need to build a bridge to wake up the Goo balls. However, you also need to burn the red goo to explode the blocks so you can reach the pipes. Then you need to plant a goo bridge in such a way that there is continuity between the red goo and the white goo, but that they are separate so the bridge continues existing after the blocks have exploded. Fine motor skills are always tough when we play games, as you need them to quickly and accurately use mouse and keyboard settings or console controllers. These are our skills allowing us to make precise and sharp movements required to achieve accuracy. We are very used to these and train them pretty much all the time as console controllers or mouse and keyboard settings require us to use particular fingers or movements at specific moments in order to master a game. Development of fine motor skills is also one of the most reported findings in research related to skills fostered by video games. This time, I will include some papers in the video description in case you want to read more about it. In World of Goo, fine motor skills are exerted when you have to accurately and quickly move a goo ball in order to create a certain structure. If you are too slow, the structure might collapse before the goo balls are put into place. 
and if you are inaccurate, you can misplace the ball or throw it away. Problem solving is a set of psychological skills which have been highly studied within psychology, cognitive sciences and informatics. In a nutshell, it consists of figuring out the set of steps that allow you to go from a starting point to a final and desired point or goal. For this, you use a series of rules which help or constrain on your advance. Scientists divide the problems into two types, well-defined problems and ill-defined problems. Well-defined problems are those where the starting point, the goal and the rules are clear, as well as the amount and types of steps necessary to go from the start to the end. These problems normally have several solutions, with one solution to be better or more efficient than the rest, and this efficiency can be measured. Well-defined problems are difficult to find in our everyday lives as our lives are more chaotic and most of our problems are ill-defined. An example of this type of problem is chess. In chess you have a big goal, to destroy the king overcoming your opponent. For this, you have to divide the task into a series of sub-goals. For example, kill other units first, defend a particular piece, or keep your king alive long enough. You can do that in a number of ways but there are always better and more elegant ways you can choose to follow. Ill-defined problems are those where we may not know all the rules, goals, or even the starting point. Ill-defined problems might have changing rules, or unspecified rules, or many different goals. So solving them is more a matter of finding a balance than a matter of achieving a static goal. An example of an ill-defined problem is management. When you are trying to manage something, like a hospital, there are several goals in mind. For example, making money or not going bankrupt, having a well-trained staff, having good equipment, and for people not to die. It is a matter of balancing budget, human resources, quality, and service. In World of Goo, problem solving comes as well-defined problems. Normally, you need to use a certain amount of goo balls to build a structure taking you from the starting point to the pipe the goo uses for traveling. Different types of goo behave in different ways, and the strategy to reach the goal changes all the time. There are also different types of scenarios, so the planning also switches, especially in those scenarios that start moving and are in constant change. So problem solving becomes an active process sometimes requiring you to experiment with different solutions and paths. The game also helps foster creativity, creative problem solving and lateral thinking. Creativity is a process we use for generating new ideas, to discover connections between them or to solve problems. It is a very complex process and even though some people regard it as something magical, such as a muse that inspires you or God sending an idea to your mind, it is not so. Creativity has been very studied and involves many steps, such as gathering information about the resources we are using for creation, gathering the resources that can be used to build connections, and an incubation period, where the ideas start to connect. Finally, bringing the idea, link, or solution to a moment of aha or eureka, where the idea is born. The theory of creativity is extensive, but I will talk more about it in future videos. Interestingly, as creativity is so difficult to assess, scientists have mostly studied creativity in problem solving, which is how we use our creativity to find new solutions to establish problems or just a solution to a very complex problem. So most of the literature on creativity, particularly experimental studies, are actually linked to problem solving. Along these lines of creativity and creative problem solving, we have lateral thinking. Lateral thinking refers to a creative way to solve problems, which is not in the lines of our common sense or logical reasoning, and which requires to look at a problem from a different angle or to play with its rules to find a new and outside-the-box solution. In World of Goo, we have different types of creativity. First, we have the World of Goo Corporation field, where the extra goo balls go after they have entered the pipe. Here you can use the goo to build the biggest tower you can, or just to play randomly with them to examine their properties. This sandbox allows you to explore the affordances of the goo, its properties, how to build different structures, or just reproduce structures, 
like the Eiffel Tower with the goo, but you can also use it to solve problems. For example, instead of building a bridge from side to side of a chasm, you just build a tall structure and then let it fall so that it reaches the other side. World of Goo is full of interesting scenarios and you can always try to complete them in a quicker way or by using less goo balls so that you can have even more goo at the sandbox. Finally, I would like to talk about assimilation and accommodation in the game. These concepts are more related to psychology theory as these are not terms we hear in our everyday life. And to be honest, I am very happy to talk about them and to see how a game can trigger these. Assimilation and accommodation are terms coined by the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget and they refer to a way we solve problems by adapting them to the way we see the world and the ways we have solved problems in the past. Piaget calls these rules we build about the world and the way we solve problems schemas. Assimilation consists of adapting the situation to a previous situation we have lived and solved, that is, adapting the problem to our schemas. So we try to see the similarities of a problem with our past experiences and try to apply that experience to solve the new problem. This is the way we normally tackle our everyday problems. Accommodation, on the other hand, consists of changing the way we see the problem so that we can find a different solution, that is, adapting or creating new schemas so they fit the problem. So instead of trying to see similarities with our experiences, we try to forget about them and think outside the box. Look for different possibilities and even try unlikely solutions. This is the way we generate new schemas and knowledge. In War of Goo, we see assimilation every time we try to solve a problem using a way we will normally do. For example, building a bridge from side to side, as that is how bridges are built in the real world. So we use the same schema we are used to. However, I find more interesting the use of accommodation in the game. After you have solved certain problems in the game, the game confronts you with similar problems which you try to assimilate, just to find out that the good old solution doesn't work here, so you need to accommodate. The game is a master at doing this, and I particularly like chapter 4, which takes the game to a totally different level and you have to forget all you have learned in the first three chapters as the whole mechanics of the games just change here. You need to adapt and create new schemas, in other words, accommodate, accounting for the new set of rules and mechanics so that you can effectively solve the problem. The design of the game is really nice. It is clean and playful. It is full of what in terms of game design is called juice. And you can see that everywhere, from the animations of the goo balls to the way the structures shake and vibrate, to the small sounds the boo goals make when they move from one side to the other. If I were to call the game something, it will be an orchestra of playfulness. The level design of the game is not something that can be commented on general terms, as every level is a puzzle in itself and affords a different challenge to any other level. So we can perfectly say that every level is a unique puzzle, and even when they present you with a similar puzzle, there is always something making it more challenging. In that sense, the level design is very clever. No puzzle is repeated, and when they trick you to think that you can use an old strategy, you realize this is not the case, and major changes should be done for you to overcome the problem. On top of this, the introduction of different mechanics and types of goo make every level a game in itself, full of exploration and accommodation. Concerning the character design, there is no real character design in the game. First, we have you, the person who controls the goo. Or are you the goo? Well, there is only one goal out there, reach that pipe. Then you have the sign painter. We know nothing of them, only that they like to tell you stories about the world of goo and paint signs. We never see or hear them. We also have mom, a huge spam server. And the goo, of course, all different types of goo, black, albino, drain, ivy, fuse, goo product, balloon, Eyeball, Water, Beauty, Ugly, Bomb, Sticky Bomb, Skull, Spike, Lounge, Infected, Pixel, Blockhead, Fish, and Pure. About the graphic design, 
Kyle Gabler, the artist behind the magic of the goo, made what I consider wonderful minimalist art. The goo balls are playful and somehow convey emotions with their little eyes. The goo structures look um, gooey and elastic, and you can figure out how to use the different goo based on their design. Take for example the red goo, which look like matches. The backgrounds are awesome and convey a mood, not only for the current chapter, but for the current level, normally depicting a season, but sometimes depicting just a general mood, particularly in the last levels of each chapter where the journey is being resolved. And of course, we have the cutscenes. I love the design of the characters here. They are goofy and silly, yet cute. And all of this is emphasized by their actions and their silly voices. And talking about voices, the sound artist was also Kyle Gabler. The voices in the game are just gibberish voices. They are not great, but together with the graphics, they help enhance this feeling of playfulness the overarching game has. The music, however, is a masterpiece. It conveys moods and feelings, while keeping you company during the challenging puzzles, but at the same time, not taking over the focus and being annoying. It makes you feel your small actions as goo are of epic proportions and make you feel huge in a world that is way bigger than you are. To be honest, I really like the music of the game since I played it the first time. Some of the songs just got stuck in my head, and I really like it as background music for studying or reading. In fact, I have the OST of the game as playlist on my Spotify. Just check this out! Games can present us with metaphors or subtexts that we as players can see and read. Although sometimes these are just given, sometimes it requires us to read between the lines to see if there is a hidden message that the designers of the game wanted to convey or if the game actually triggers certain associations in you. Regarding other possible readings of World of Goo, I think of the game as a journey through consumerism and exploitations of resources. We start with the goo, which looks somehow like petrol. The goo is harvested through pipes and taken to this company where it is refining to other products. People love it, so they start consuming more and more, so much that they need another energy source so they can keep on producing. After they have found a new energy source, they produce even more until the world's inhabitants are destroyed. In the end, the goo is extinct. Only a few balls of goo survive, and without any people in the world or anything to harvest them, they are free to roam the world and look for new horizons in an already destroyed and contaminated world. Normally, at this part of the video, I will talk about problems implementing the game in formal and informal settings, but to be totally honest with you, I really don't see any problem with this game whatsoever. It's just so cleverly done and it just fits every age. The game is cute and totally suited for children of all ages. The game encourages creativity and exploration, so it doesn't really matter if it takes a lot of time or tries for a child to get to the end of a level. Moreover, it doesn't matter if they reach the end of the level at all, they can still learn. The game can also be found in a multiple of mobile devices and consoles, so if you work in a school where students have access to tablets, you could totally use it without having to buy a console or putting your students in front of a computer. And of course, the same applies at home, where your children can play with a tablet or cell phone. The game doesn't have microtransactions, so it's also totally safe for children to handle. Now, how can you use the game at home or school? This one is actually very easy to answer. The nature of the game 
as a puzzle-solving quest does all the work for you. From planning, development of strategies, creativity, creative problem-solving, everything. It's just play and roll with it. Something you might want to observe is how your students or children solve the puzzles. Maybe they are taking too long or maybe they are taking many goo balls. You can challenge them to solve the problem using less goo balls or doing it quicker or even better to solve the problem in a different way. Take care if your children or students are getting frustrated because they cannot solve a puzzle. Maybe there is something they haven't realized or maybe there is a mechanic they don't understand. And if that's the case, you can explain a little bit or bring some cognitive insight or do some questions that develop cognitive insight and always bring emotional support. Also, check if the person is trying to solve the problem using the same strategy again and again. Trying the same strategy, expecting different results, shows a problem with adaptability. Meaning that the person might be trying to assimilate the problem trying to make their schemas fit the reality, instead of accommodating to it, creating a new strategy. If that's the case, I will suggest you to make a series of guiding questions, allowing the player to break a little bit their schemas and open their mind to new solutions. I hope you liked the video, and if you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to use the comment section. See you next month, until then, take care. If you find my videos interesting, please leave a like or a comment and consider subscribing to my channel for more content.